there. Ah, good to see you. Welcome, welcome everybody. So I have a question for y'all. Yeah, hello. Who here is ready to get noticed? Who's ready to be more assertive? Who is ready to take your game to 11? In my simple four stage process, we can totally do that for you. Both time is short, and I wanna make sure you get the most for your money, so let's get started. Picture this scenario. You have a database server, and you got yourself a log drive, and it starts to fill, and that's, that happens. And then all of a sudden, that drive runs out of space, okay? But no one looks at that alert. You follow me? So then you have a problem with another drive. All of a sudden, things start slowing down. Database stops working. All of a sudden, the application is having problems, right? This happens, but people ignored the first alert. So you didn't get noticed. No one knows this is a problem. All of a sudden, your end users start calling. And your end users are calling and they're saying, hey, I can't get to my stuff. And you say, whoa, 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 I didn't know about that. So the real question is, who benefits from an ignored alert? Nobody. That's right, nobody. For me, as an alert life coach, I find it better to work with real life alert situations. So do we have someone from the audience? Anybody? Uh, Yes, you, sir, in the black, white, and gray in the front row. Thank you. Uh, can you please tell us your story? Hi. <clears throat> I am a web server low in space. Fantastic. It's great to have you here today. Thank you so much. And thank you for being brave for telling your story. Now, I need to ask you a question. So what happened the last time you interacted with somebody? Yeah, an issue in an object you are monitoring occurred on Wednesday at 11.37 a.m., uh, view full object details here, colon, https, colon, slash, slash, orion, dot, domain, dot, local, slash, orion, slash, Okay, I'm going to stop you right there. So, uh, I need to ask you a very, very personal question. Are you a plain text alert? Yes, sir, I am, and I include links to show more details. Uh-huh, but do you ever actually mention what the problem is? Do you ever say what thresholds have been violated? Do you ever actually come out and say what the issue is and why it needs attention right now? Uh, I include links to show more details. Thank you so much, Web Server with Low Disk Space, for sharing that with us. Uh, question for the rest of the audience. How many here are plain text alerts? So one of the easiest ways for plain alerts to kind of get some notice is to kind of punch it up a little bit, add a little pizzazz, make sure you go from plain to panache, from drab to dynamic, to make sure you go from lackluster to blockbuster. And how do you do that? A little bit of HTML and CSS is all it takes. Just like collecting the information and understanding what's important to your stakeholders, there are also four phases to alert success, and we're gonna have to go over them individually. The first one is all about collecting the data that you're gonna present. You already got this information from your stakeholders, you had those conversations, you needed to understand what information is gonna make your alert actionable. Once you have that information, we can go into Orion and go ahead and pull that information out so you can organize it later. Let's go ahead and see what we can do for web server low on space. I already have some trigger actions defined here and a couple escalation levels, but let's go ahead and build another email message. So we'll go ahead and add an action, send an email slash page. We'll have to give it a good name. We'll select the recipients. And then we'll get into the message. This is the important part. This is the way that all new alerts get generated, and it is incredibly generic. It is completely functional, but horrifically lacking details. So I want to go ahead and build a list of what details I want. So the first thing I'm going to do, just for record keeping purposes, is strike out everything. I don't recommend you do this frequently, but if you have an alert you can play with, this is the best way to do it. And now I want to go ahead and start inserting variables. And I think of variables in one of two ways. I think variables that are very specific for the alert itself and ones that are very specific for the triggered object. So we're gonna go ahead and start with the alerts. 
And here I want to grab everything I think is important, whether I'm going to use it or not at the end, but everything I feel is important here to provide to the individual who's going to interact with this alert. So there's some information I want in every single alert I send to someone. There's always the alert description. There's always the alert message. There's always going to be the alert name. I want the time of this current trigger and probably the number of times it has been triggered overall. And last but not least, the severity. I'm going to go ahead and insert those variables. You can see they're all here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all this, I'm going to grab it all, and I'm going to put it in a plain text file. So these are all my alert variables. Now, they've each just been separated with spaces, but for me, I like to go ahead and separate them so they're each on their own lines. This is just a way that I keep this information organized. And then I give it a little description. This one is alert based variables. Excellent. Those are all the variables about the alert itself, you know, when it was triggered, what the name of it is, those kinds of things. But now I need to know information about the object, in this case, a volume. So let's go ahead, strike all that out, and we'll insert new variables. This time, we will do it for the volume. Since there can be literally hundreds of variables bound to the specific target entity type, you probably want to have something specific in mind. So for me, I'm going to go ahead and select a hard drive I know is on a web server. So I will click Change. I will search for East Web. And I will select the first hard drive. So now we're specifically looking at East Web Core 01V and the C drive on that machine. So any alerts I pick from here will give you an output preview commiserate with that device. So we want to look for the amount of free space available. And all things space related are probably going to have the word space in them. So let's go ahead and see that. There we go. We have a recap of the alert name. Here's our available space. Let's go ahead and select that. Let's select our thresholds for critical, the current value, how much space has been used. One of the things we're missing here, though, is the actual name of the volume. And in Orion, most things for names are called caption. So we'll look for captions. There we go. Here's the caption for the drive. Here's the caption for the node. You can see it's even mentioned that this is specifically for the node. And I think that's probably enough. So let's go ahead and insert the variables. Again, I'm going to grab all of these, move them over to a notepad, create a new area called triggered object, and paste in the variables. Again, just a little bit of formatting. All right, so I think we have everything we need to actually build an alert now. So let's go ahead and do some very, very basic HTML and just frame it out. Once we've collected the information we want to present, we kind of have to decide how we want to organize it. For me, an alert of this magnitude needs some very specific information. So I always picture it as a table. And above that table, I have the alert details. That is the name of the alert. That is the time it was triggered. That was the threshold information. And then in the table, I want to have the specifics for the targeted device. So I would have a whole bunch of lines, the table with a description, and then the numbers or the names. Below it, I'll also put like some acknowledgement information and maybe a link directly back to the alert. So maybe a URL here or something like that. So that's it. That's my layout. You can also include things like bullet lists, links, and large text blocks. Any of these things are fine. So let's go ahead and mock that up real quickly in HTML. If you're not comfortable writing HTML kind of from scratch using something like Notepad, you can always use a WYSIWYG editor. In the past, I've used Adobe Dreamweaver, I've used Aloha Editor, and I've used Notepad++ in a pinch. Uh, but today, I'm going to go ahead and show you how to use Microsoft Visual Studio Code, and I've added the extensions IntelliSense for CSS names and HTML, Live Server, and Prettier Code Formatter. If we go back to my mock-up and design, I want alert details at the top. So that's pretty easy. We'll just go ahead and select the alert variables. We'll copy them. And we'll put them in HTML form. Now, if you want to talk about the very basics, let's go ahead and wrap these 
That's a paragraph tag, and then HTML always closes with a slash tag. So slash p for paragraph, close of paragraph. And we'll just do that down. Then we're going to want a table to build a table in HTML. Table. VS Code automatically closes tags for you, which is really nice. Then we define a table row. And then we define a table cell. And let's go ahead and put some of the node information in there. So this one we'll do just one at a time. Volume space available. And because this variable and the other ones like it are going to come in as pure numbers, we need some type of description. Now for me, I do that with what's called a table header. So that is th, and then volume space available. I'll go ahead and save that. And now because we have the live server installed, I can just hit down here, go live. And this is what it looks like. Right now it is, of course, very plain, but you can see the table beginning to take shape. So to make the table a little more obvious, let's go ahead and put on a border. Border equals one. Now it's in red and that's intentional. We'll come back to that when we actually style it with CSS. Resave it, go back, refresh, and there you go. You can see the border. So you can see how the table can actually start to build. Then I can just repeat this row over and over again for the other variables. Resave, go back to the browser, refresh. That's all it takes. Now what we're looking at here isn't much better than a plain text alert, so let's go ahead and really kind of pretty it up. But for that, I'm going to start with the template that I've already built. This template has everything you need to get started. It's a doc type defined, it is the open HTML tag, the open and close head tags with all the styles and information, then the body tag and tables and a bunch of information on it. This is a template I can use for all alerts because it's very, very generic. What we're going to do next is define some CSS that actually changes the way the HTML is interpreted and displayed. We'll just start with defining an alert header description. So this is dot alert header, open curly braces, some details about it. We want the font size a little bit up. We want the color to be a certain way. We want it aligned. We want it weighted. Here we're defining our own CSS style. Now, I prefer to do this stuff in CSS. You can always do this in the individual tags with the style element, but then if you make a change somewhere, it's not global. You got to go and hunt it out and find it. So if we take this alert header definition, then I can just add the class tag here equals alert header. And let's go ahead and save that. And as before, let's preview it. And although this is very plain, you can see that the alert description here did get changed based around that CSS class that was assigned. So let's go ahead and define a couple more. If you're not familiar with CSS, you'll notice that this definition starts with a dot or a period. And what that means is this is a custom class you've built. But one of the things that's really interesting you can do with CSS is rebrand, recolor, and restyle existing HTML tags. So here you can see that I'm using table header, table header, table header. I'm using it repeatedly. So let's go ahead and build a CSS style for that. For that one, you omit the dot, and then you just fill in the information as before. In this case, I selected the same font family. I selected a slightly different font size, bold, white, and the reason I chose white for the foreground color is because the background color is going to go to this orange. Same thing as before, make sure we align it to the left and vertically align the middle. Now, if you notice before, table header elements are all center aligned and automatically bolded. But after I make this change, you can see they have now all gone left aligned. They're still bolded, but they're white with an orange backdrop. If you really need to draw someone's eye, there's nothing better than using colors like this especially if you have them tied to like a yellow for a warning event or a red for a critical event. And I'm just gonna go ahead and use a CSS that I've been using for a while now. So it has the alert header definition, the alert description definition, details, table, the metrics table has a slightly different feel, table header has been redone, table cell has been redone, and I'm actually changing the body so it's not quite white. So if I save that, go over, Interesting. So you can see the background may be difficult to see. It's not quite pure white, so it's slightly easier on the eyes, but we haven't really applied any of those tags anywhere. By redefining a tag like the TD tag, I don't actually have to apply this class information in anymore. It's been inherited. I can strike that out and immediately takes effect. So now all of my detail information looks the same. Now maybe this green is not so easy on the eyes. So if we want to change that, at least in Visual Studio Code, all you have to do is click on the color 
and select a different color. Maybe I want this something in, a, in the blue family. So let's go ahead and bring it down here. Bluish purple. There you go. A little easier on the eyes. After playing with the styling a little bit and making sure it meets your requirements and also meets those of your stakeholders and the people receiving these alerts, you're pretty much done. And this is what the final alert would look like in my environment for web server low on disk space. So here's the one I've built. And we'll go ahead and look at the live preview. And there you go. So I've gone a little bit above and beyond on this. I've made sure we just have the information there that says exactly why it was triggered, what it looks like, any previous steps that have been done. And at the bottom, we have the information to be able to acknowledge this alert and also a full description of the alert. Now that I know that's what I want, I can just copy it all and paste the whole thing in as my message. Of course, finish out by selecting your server, time of day, execution settings, and that's it. So here it is, email server admins. And then if I wanna see what it'll actually look like with real data in it, I can select my element and simulate. And there you go. We have the full definition of what the alert is, what work we have already done on it, the node, the volume, including status icons and device icons. So was that so hard? No, no, no. Was that so hard? Exactly. With just a little bit of work, you too can get noticed. And that's it for me today. I want to thank everyone for being a part of this. Thank you so much, Web Server with Low Disk Space, for being our volunteer. And I am Kevin Sparenberg. Please be sure to sign up for my next seminar, Why Informational Alerts Should Just Be Reports. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you.